What if I told you that for one weekend, Elemental Hero Stratos was the single most broken card in all of Yu-Gi-Oh? You laugh now, but before the days of Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer and Dark Dragoons, there was Stratos and Airblade Turbo, otherwise known as Diamond Dew Turbo in the TCG. What if I also told you that after two weeks of being at three, Konami hit Stratos quicker than nearly any other card ever hit on the ban list? What if I also told you it was due to Stratos being a Shonen Jump magazine promo? My name is Avery, and thanks to all of you voting in my poll asking you what format you wanted me to cover next, we are now covering a format all the way back in 2007. This is an Airblade Turbo format retrospective. Stratos is unbanned! Stratos is unbanned! Stratos is unbanned! Stratos is unbanned! Stratos, oh my, Stratos is unbanned! Stratos is unbanned! Morphing Jar, what the fuck is this list? I would also like to mention that a portion of this script comes from Jason Grabber Meyer's article on Airblade Turbo Format on TCG Player, simply because there is very little information about this format online. So big shout out to Jason for this info, link to the article will be in the description. So let's wind the clocks back to 2007 and give a background on Shonen Jump Magazine subscriptions before we get into the Airblade deck format itself. For years, some of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s greatest cards didn't come in booster packs or structure decks or any normal on-shelf product. Instead, they were released as one-time promo cards in Shonen Jump Magazines, the flagship Western publication owned by Shueisha, the company that published the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga and its later spin-offs. The Yu-Gi-Oh! brand's a complicated beast. Different licensing companies have different stakes in the brand, from the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG and OCG we know and love, to the manga, the anime, the four feature films, the merchandise, the broadcasting rights, etc, etc. That's way too many things to list on the screen, so just enjoy the purple background. <laughs> different parties manage and own rights to different stuff, but Shueisha's always been one of the biggest stakeholders, and for that reason, they long held the right to pack exclusive promo cards into their magazines and trade paperbacks. And because of those rights were so favorable, absolutely amazing cards got released for the TCG in Shonen Jump magazine and in the OCG, its Japanese corollaries like Weekly Shonen Jump. What started off as a promo series built on cards like alternate art versions of Blue Eyes White Dragon and Red Eyes Black Dragon turned into the exclusive release venue for hyped cards like Green Baboon, Defender of the Forest, Victory Dragon, Vandalgon the Dark Dragon Lord, Summon Sorceress, and even Dandelion. Some of the most exciting cards would only be available to Shonen Jump subscribers or anyone lucky enough to get to their local newsstands and magazine sellers before everybody else. And that was a problem. In fact, it was a problem for a lot of reasons. On one hand, if you were a player, collector, or local level card dealer with your finger on the pulse, these promos were great because having a Shonen Jump subscription was like printing money, often to the tune of a few hundred dollars a year per subscription. Not only did many, and in some years, most issues of the magazine have a promo card, but annual subscribers got even more promos just for subscribing, often the best ones like Dandelion and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon. It wasn't uncommon for quote-unquote that guy at your locals to have dozens of subscriptions serving as everybody's hookup for the Shonen Jump promos. And while the fine print said subscriptions were one per person, people often just made up names of family members who didn't exist or fake apartment numbers at their own address to score or as many subscriptions as they could get away with. So on one hand, you had a relatively small portion of the dueling population that was making decent piles of cash off of Shonen Jump subscriptions. You also had a bunch of other players forced to pay those guys for promos because they had no other way of getting them reliably. And somewhere in between, you had a mad scramble for the issues of Shonen Jump that had good promo cards which would regularly sell out the day they hit shelves. The fact that nobody really knew what day Shonen Jump would drop onto news racks didn't help. And the unfortunate twist that the magazines were often targeted for theft in store with people tearing out the promo cards by the fistful and running for the door didn't help either. This was a problem for retailers, players, and pretty much everybody except the guys in the know holding dozens of subscriptions. And it was also a problem for Europe, and this is where things get really wild. Latin America, Australia, and New Zealand were the big places, and everywhere else that Shonen Jump magazine wasn't sold in that part of the world, which for the majority of the time was everywhere but Canada and the United States. You didn't live in North America? Well, for years, you had to order your promo cards from stores or individual sellers 
sellers overseas, often at very high prices, plus shipping, plus taxes, and import fees. That's why Shonen Jump promos started getting reprinted in stuff like Champion Packs, or as European event promos for tournaments like the Pharaoh's Tour way back in the day, or in special editions or collector's tins. Eventually, the policy would change, and promos would just be banned in territories where they weren't officially distributed, until they appeared in a product in that region. But for a long time, some of the game's key competitive cards cost a small fortune if you weren't Canadian or American, and until the policy on promos changed, there was nothing that you could do about it. Jason's article even has a bullet point that says, quote, you can find some different opinions and varying accounts if you talk to old schoolers in the know. That's how crazy this time period was, y'all. While this all started as a kind of weird niche of the player-to-player -player secondary market, big stores specializing in Yu-Gi-Oh! singles caught on pretty fast and realized they could get in on the near-free piles of cash. Certain stores suddenly seemed to have dozens of the hottest new promo card the moment the magazines arrived in stores. Were they running a bigger version of the lots of subscriptions shadiness players were exploiting? Did they have official deals to distribute the magazines despite not being booksellers? Suffice to say, a handful of big Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG sellers never had the magazines in stock and yet had plenty of promos. And sometimes, they seemed to have the cards before booksellers did. It wasn't uncommon for subscribers to receive their magazines a bit before or a bit after the newsstand release. Nothing weird there. Individual subscriptions were sent via the postal system, while store stock copies were sent through industry distribution chains. Whether or not card stores got their magazines and promos, or perhaps just stacks of promos without magazines at all via some special arrangement, no one will ever know. So it wasn't uncommon for stores to occasionally have tons of new promo cards available for sale before some subscribers had their copies. Sometimes they had them up to two weeks before anybody else seemed to. And that was a problem, because Shonen Jump promos, they didn't really have an official release date. The cards were legal for you to play as soon as you could get your hands on them. That sucked, but in February of 07, it became an even bigger issue, because topping the list of all-time greatest Shonen Jump promos was our boy Stratos. Now, with all that being said, SJC St. Louis took place on the weekend of February 24th, 2007. Now, if you check the official TCG database entry for Stratos, you'll see the first printing was the Jump EN012 promo card from the April 2007 edition of Shonen Jump magazine with an official release date in the database of April 21st, 2007. Keep these dates in mind. In reality, issues of Shonen Jump magazine usually hit newsstands prior to the official month of publication. That's not a surprise. Stratos was widely available in March of 07 to subscribers and briefly on shelves before all the copies were snatched up by eager players and collectors. However, a limited number of stores received their copies of Stratos even earlier, and at least one party got them in so early that they had them in hand on or prior to the week of Monday, February 19th. And since promo cards were legal the moment you had them, that meant a very limited number of people, fewer than 20, perhaps as few as 10 or 12, walked on up to SJC St. Louis with Stratos weeks before regular players would even see them for sale. That wasn't just a problem because Stratos was a revolutionary card at the time, in an era of Yu-Gi-Oh! where from-the-deck search effects were still pretty rare. Remember, in 2007, there were no synchros, no exceeds, no link monsters. Priority was still a ruling at the time. Most themes didn't have their own search cards, and at the time, Yu-Gi-Oh! wasn't really about name-stamped themes anyway. The top decks of the time were grindy Monarch variants built around Cyber Dragon and Soul Exchange, which we will touch on later. Or, if you weren't playing Monarchs, maybe you ran something like Machines with Card Trooper milling to power up Bazu the Soul Eater for a good old classic Bazu beatdown. This was an era of beatdown on one hand and Monarch plus ones on the other. But then, it suddenly wasn't. Out of the hundreds of competitors at SJC St. Louis, a handful had access to Elemental Hero Stratos. Despite that number being so low, five players with Stratos wound up making the cut to top eight. And they're all names that you can look back on and recognize today. Chris Bowling, Carlo Perez, Mark Glass, Miguel Alberhan, and Jeff Jones. No, I'm not putting up all those pictures because that's way too much research, dear God. <laughs> the three duelists who didn't have Stratos that weekend but still managed to top eight included Jeff Baumgartner. In his first of what would be three SJC tops that year, and Andrew Fredella, already a one-time SJC winner at that time. Bong Gartner was on an innovative rat box strategy, and Fredella was running a really well-perfected Monarch build teching Hydra Get On that you can see both decklists on your screen right now. Fantastic, decorated duelists with smart decks ready to outplay anything coming their way from the known meta. And they were all screwed. 
the players running Stratos didn't have just one legal copy, <laughs> no, 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 as a new promo that wasn't supposed to be out yet. It wouldn't be limited until the March 1st Forbidden and Limited list the Thursday after the Shonen Jump. So for one week and one championship, about 12 players were able to play three copies of Elemental Hero Stratos when basically nobody else could. It's not their fault, it's a competitor's duty to do everything they can within the rules to win, and the rules allowed this to happen. The upper deck days were insane, but that said, there's never been a time before this where a single group of players have ever had such a wild advantage in a sanctioned Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. Over in the OCG, Triple Stratos had actually been legal for a while, and Japanese players used it to create an entirely new kind of strategy, one that's probably more at home in modern Yu-Gi-Oh today, and was entirely bizarre in the I Summon a Monarch days of 2000. 2007. It was called Airblade Turbo, named after Elemental Hero Airman, or as Stratos was known in the OCG, and Divine Sword Phoenix Blade. Now with that being set in your mind, let's actually talk about the format. The final mix-up to this early 2007 format was the introduction of three more meta-defining new cards in February. Destiny Hero Malicious, Card Trooper, and the aforementioned Stratos. Card Trooper wouldn't really catch on in the competitive scene immediately, and it mostly saw use as a tech in Chimera Tech OTK decks upon its release. Malicious and Stratos, on the other hand, would combine together into a very potent new deck that would go on to absolutely dominate the format in some form or another for months to come. Airblade Turbo, later called Diamond Dew Turbo. So the Airblade Turbo version of the deck focused on using the three legal copies of Monster Gate, Reasoning, and Stratos, and using the latter two to fill the graveyard with warrior-type monsters, which could then be banished in large quantities by Divine Sword Phoenix Blade. The banished monsters could then be summoned back all at once, using Dimension Fusion, allowing for easy OTKs. The deck would prove to be extremely consistent due to the wide variety of draw power cards such as Destiny Draw and Graceful Charity, in combination with the three copies of Stratos, which could search all relevant monsters. This deck was pretty complicated by the standards of Yu-Gi-Oh! in 2007. It was one of the first decks to demand that its pilot keep a running table of draw odds in their head trying to figure out what was likely to come off the top from their next graceful charity or their diamond dude or their reasoning. It was actually pretty novel and fun at the time, and since it was already influential in the OCG, there were lots of in-the-weeds pojo board types who'd played it before, even if they just proxied it up and goldfished it. Along with Monster Gate and Reasoning, you could also abuse the discards of Card Destruction, Destiny Draw, Lightning Vortex, and Magical Stone Excavation to fill up your graveyard for Phoenix Blade. As you did, you'd banish the Warriors to get back Phoenix Blade, making your powerful discard effects free and removing those monsters from play. Then, when you'd cleared the field and have enough attackers ready, you'd Dimension Fusion and take the game. There were lots of ins and outs here. The deck had to vie for chip damage whenever possible. It had to play optimally all the time to try and get max value with Diamond Dude, and it had to consider its discard really carefully, but it was a hugely explosive deck when no other deck was, and opposing decks generally weren't closing out games in one turn, so the Airblade Turbo player could bide their time and make smart bets to max their chances of making best case plays. It could also chump block really well since it didn't care about keeping monsters on the field until the turn it won, and blockers like Stratos and Malicious were basically free anyways. So let's look at Perez's deck and Mark Glass's deck side by side. The main difference is that while Perez played no trap cards, instead favoring more consistency with cards like E, Emergency Call, and Card Destruction, which Glass didn't run, as well as more copies of Reasoning, Glass played Mirror Force and Triple Wabaku. Both decks were trying to see more cards in different ways, but the way they do it becomes a factor in the finals when, spoiler, Perez and Glass face off. Hey guys, this is Post Production Avery here, and I just want to say real quick that the website that I use to find retro deck lists like this only gave Mark Glass a 29 card main deck, so I ended up throwing in the th the one Mirror Force and the three Wabaku in his version of the deck, since most Airblade Turbo decks seem to be pretty much the same during this era of Yu-Gi-Oh, but I just wanted to throw that out there that as you're looking at this deck list, I'm sure it was 40 cards, I just don't know what to take out to make it 40 so that it's exactly like Mark Glass's build. So I tried to get it as close as possible to his build. And for reference, Mark Glass's deck list, as close as I could get it, is on the right side of your screen, and Carlos Perez is on the left side of the screen. Carlos Perez's build should be 100% accurate. Mark Glass is up in the air. So if someone can leave a comment or tell me what is different, that would be greatly appreciated. And I hope that you're enjoying the video. Be sure to leave a like. It really means a lot. This deck was busted, and it was just playing on a different level than anything else at the SJC. Hindsight being 2020 and doing research for this video, it doesn't even look like it was playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in the same year, and the people who came up against it that weekend, they were less than excited about it. 
Imagine if you went to an event where everybody played Black Wings and five people in the room show up with Sword Soul. Yeah, it's going to be a bloodbath. Of the five players running three Stratos when nobody else had Stratos, three of them ran Airblade Turbo. Fun fact, the deck was referred to as Diamond Dew Turbo in the official coverage because the coverage team couldn't refer to OCG card names in a TCG event, hence the two names. Those three players were top eight finisher Miguel Alboran, finalist Mark Glass, and eventual winner Carlo Perez. Jeff Jones made top eight with a deck he insisted people just call quote-unquote Stratos, which was a much for fair trade-driven strategy. It aimed to grind out card advantage and simplify with one-for-ones like Smashing Ground, Bottomless Trap Hole, and Sakurazu Armor, and it basically played like a better gadget deck. Chris Bowling just stuck Stratos into a machine beatdown deck featuring Card Trooper, Bazo the Soul Eater, and Dimension Fusion. It was kind of a way worse version of Airblade Turbo since both decks relied on Dimension Fusion as their win conditions, and Airblade Turbo was straight up better at abusing it. So with the top eight consisting of two format standard Monarch decks, a Rogue Rat Box build, Chris Bowling's Not As Good deck, Jeff Jones's Stratos, and three relentlessly overpowered Airblade Turbos, the top eight bracket was wild. Jeff Jones, who had never made a top 8 in a real-life event at this point, gets run over by former SJC champion Andrew Fredella in a 2-0 victory that only takes something like 24 minutes. Monarchs go over Stratos in the top 8 as Jones hits some bad draws, and Fredella does an expert job of bluffing back row, making the simplified game work better for him than it does for his opponent. Carlo Perez and Miguel Alboran play an Airblade Turbo Mirror match with Perez winning out. Mark Glass, coming off of a top 8 at SJC Orlando a few weeks prior, takes Airblade Turbo against Tommy Nguyen, who's maybe the only player in the room who saw what was happening and changed his deck up on Friday. Nguyen's playing Monarchs, but he punts Treeborn Frog in favor of Triple Dimensional Fisher, Macrocosmos, and Triple DD Survivor. God, I remember those days playing DD Survivor. Can we please have D Fisher and Macro back at 3? We have Skill Drain at 3, Konami. I want my Floodgates back. <laughs> It's possible Nguyen was looking to beat out the Treeborn Frog Monarch decks and stuff like Card Trooper, but I think that as the only non-named competitor in the top 8 not playing Stratos, he saw the writing on the wall and made a very smart call to run a deck designed to beat Airblade Turbo. Maybe that happened, maybe it didn't. Regardless, and to quote Jason's article, Mark Glass struggles briefly before drop-kicking Nguyen straight into the sun and out of the dueling history books forever. Seriously, Nguyen has one top cut list in our deck archive, and I have no idea what happened to him after February 25th. I hope he's doing great. The best revenge is healthy living. I freaking love Jason's articles. Oh, and Jeff Baumgartner's crazy box of rats goes over Chris Bowling's weird underpowered Stratos stuck in a random deck because maybe Bowling got his copies Friday and didn't have enough time to figure out what to do with them Dimension Fusion beatdown thing. Again, a lot of this comes from Jason's article. I freaking love his writing. It is fantastic. <laughs> so we hit top four. From here, it's just Carlo Perez bodying the former champion Fredella with a 2-0 in 15 minutes flat, and Mark Glass wiping out Jeff Baumgartner's rat box in another 2-0 blowout. None of these games are even close. You can look up the coverage. Fredella's effectively running a well-trained racehorse against a literal 1,000-mile-an-hour Dodge Challenger, and Baumgartner's got this exceptionally smart, graceful anti-meta deck that was built to tackle a meta game that he's suddenly no longer playing in. <laughs> Jason even talked about how he remembered being at the coverage table with a sick case of food poisoning, and he says, and I quote, Despite the horror of what was unfolding in this event, as competitive Yu-Gi-Oh collapsed into a black hole before my very eyes, I thought to myself, thank God I'll be back in my room throwing up again any minute now. And that's what happened. Two expert players who know this super unique deck inside and out go head to head and despite Perez going first in game one and playing absolutely nothing on his first turn, he hits hard with card destruction to get back in it and wins the duel from there. Game two goes back and forth but Perez finds his place first, ends up playing Cybernetic Magician of all things, getting his Destiny Hero Malicious into the graveyard with it and rides that to victory. The entire top eight's basically Mark Glass and Carlo Perez on opposite sides of the bracket with near identical decks running the field until they meet in the finals for a mirror match that not only doesn't happen again ever, but literally can't because the deck's effectively banned four days later, and the policies surrounding promo cards end up changing so that something this unfair and full of baby back bullshit can never be repeated.
Needless to say, this is very interesting to look back on now, but was a flashpoint of fury for any competitor attending SJC St. Louis who didn't have the Stratos hookup. People paid hundreds of dollars for flights and hotel rooms to play an enjoyable weekend of Monarchs and Beatdown, and then they just got utterly destroyed because their opponents showed up with Yu-Gi-Oh cards from the future. Everybody knew what Stratos was, too, because it was so huge in the OCG. So the moment they heard it was somehow at the event and legal at 3, you can imagine how pissed the Yu-Gi-Oh! community was. It was very clear from round 1 what was going to happen. The only question was, who is it going to happen to? Leaving everyone to wonder just how long they could avoid getting totally demolished by this should-be-illegal murder machine that wasn't even supposed to exist yet. Today, we love Stratos, and many people have a fondness for Airblade Turbo. But that weekend in 2007, it was one of the most hated Yu-Gi-Oh decks ever. This small format ended with the March 2007 Forbidden list. The limiting of Overload Fusion killed Chimera Tech OTK, the forbidding of Cyberstein eliminated Stein OTK, the limiting of Chain Strike neutered Chainburn, <laughs> and the forbidding of Graceful Charity shunted Dark World from the meta. Stratos was also limited to stop Airblade Turbo that following Thursday after the event, thank god. The main surviving decks from that point were Monarchs and the remains of Airblade Turbo, now just called Diamond Dew Turbo. Monarch Control would continue using a similar philosophy that had brought it to victory in the Lazaro Spicer format of late 2006, but now with more up-to-date cards. The Apprentice Magician had become abandoned in favor of a combination of Gravekeeper Spy for floating and Legendary Jiu-Jitsu Master to make attacking into face-down defense position monsters dangerous. Outside of the new floaters, Monarchs had also adopted it two to three copies each of Soul Exchange and Brain Control as standard. All these together led to a variant of Monarchs establishing itself that many people refer to today as Soul Control Monarchs. Monarchs received further support in May of 2007 with the release of Rise of the Storm Monarch and Force of the Breaker. Rise of was a particularly powerful card as it offered non-destruction and non-banishing removal, making it much more difficult to recover from card advantage-wise as monsters cannot be revived from the deck. Due to their continued power in the introduction of Rise of the Soul Control Monarch deck was able to establish itself with the most tops of the format. This wasn't by a very wide margin, however, and the deck certainly was not unbeatable. The remainder of the meta was split between several different decks. Destiny Hero variants, Card Trooper variants, Gadgets, and Demise OTK. In the wake of Stratos being limited, Diamond Dew Turbo became the dominant variant of Destiny Heroes. The deck relied on the extremely powerful card advantage generation of Destiny Hero monsters, especially the epitomous Destiny Hero Diamond Dude. Because of the easy searching provided by Stratos and Rhoda, Diamond Dew Turbo established itself as one of the first major meta decks that rose to prominence based largely on its consistency rather than its power. The deck also made great use of Destiny Hero Disc Commander's effect using Premature Burial alongside Dark Magician of Chaos, which could very easily recycle it. Dark Magician of Chaos also had very good synergy with both Dimension Fusion and Metamorphosis, making it much easier for the deck to finish opponents off. Diamond Dude Turbo still made use of Reasoning, Monster Gate, and Magical Stone Excavation as well to easily reach the deck's many spell cards. Destiny Heroes also saw some usage in mid-2007 as an engine in other decks, most notably in Monarchs, a combination that would be a precursor to the later format of 2007. With the September 2007 Forbidden List, the meta shifted again as Card Trooper and Megamorph were limited, effectively eliminating the more dedicated Card Trooper decks and the various different OTK decks that relied on Megamorph, such as Demise OTK. The list also semi-limited Destiny Hero Malicious and limited Destiny Hero Disc Commander, making it much more difficult for pure Destiny Hero decks to stay afloat in the meta. Metamorphosis was also forbidden on this list, taking a large portion of Diamond Dew Turbo's OTK potential with it. Even Monarchs got an indirect hit in the form of Brain Control being limited. Finally, the gadgets were all semi-limited to rein the gadgets in. With their individual engines stripped of their former power and consistency, Diamond Dew Turbo and Monarchs could no longer stand alone in the meta. However, this did not mean they could not combine into a single deck that would take advantage of the remains of both engines. Perfect Circle Monarchs. This deck utilized the Destiny Hero Draw Engine and Destiny Hero Malicious for easy tributes to make for easier tribute summoning of the Monarch monsters. Perfect Circle Monarchs also made use of a card that came out in late 2007, Light and Darkness Dragon, as I've said before on this channel, one of my favorite cards of all time. Lad served as a boss monster for the deck, something which it lacked after the loss of Metamorphosis. While the Monarch monsters were very powerful, they only had powerful effects when they were summoned, making them easier to take care of after that. Lad's effect, however, gave most other decks a very different Difficult time. To top it all off, Light and Darkness would special another monster after being destroyed, making so that even after opponents got over it, its controller would maintain some card advantage. Stall decks also caught on in the meta at this point. Unfortunately, an ever-present force. These decks were initially too slow with their limited burn options to go in for the kill, while later on decks would prove too fast and outpace their stall engines. Stall made a resurgence at this point due largely to the slew of newer, 
powerful trap cards that could control the game. While also using some new monsters like Neo Space and Grand Mole, which was released earlier in 2007, and could remove any monster from the field without having to destroy it, and without letting its own controller take damage. The main card that brought stall decks into the meta, however, was Marshmallow, as it was only removable through card effects at a time when the main source of effect removal was in tribute monsters such as Ryza or battle traps that Marshmallow would never trigger. Marshmallow also dealt a thousand points of damage when it was flipped face up, making it a formidable burn card for slower decks. It must be noted, however, that while all these decks managed to get some scattered tops at regionals and showings at SJCs, the format remained largely dominated by Perfect Circle Monarchs, which carried with it the remains of a deck that everyone hated, Airblade Turbo. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. This was a lot of work and research. Uh, if you look at Jason's article, you'll see that I quoted a lot of things and took pieces of the article and put it in the script. I really want to give all of that original creator credit to Jason Grabermeyer. The link to that article will be in the description. It's a very great read. Jason puts out very great content with articles on TCG Player Infinite. And I had a great time uh, doing this video as a loud ass motorcycle goes by my window. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for voting in the poll for what should be next. Let me know in the comments what you would like to see next. I'm sure I'll have another poll up at, at some point or another. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next video.